Good morning, church. Good morning. Uh, we are, what a day uh, to come into the house of the Lord to celebrate um, the beginning of the Easter week um, at Palm Sunday. And so if you are the first time visitor, um, as you're new this week, we want to extend a special welcome to you. Um, make sure you fill out one of those connect cards and drop it off at the Welcome Center in the back. Uh, we would love to connect with you in this and Sends you some more information about the church and just different events coming up. Speaking of events coming up, as I said, this is Easter week, right? And so on Thursday, we are going to be doing Maundy Thursday service. Uh, we will be doing the Last Supper, Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper, a live portrayal of that picture. Um, and so Dan has put a lot of work into it. Um, getting the set ready um, and the actors and the costumes ready for that. And so we hope that you come to that. Invite someone, invite a family member or a friend or a neighbor um, to come with you as we begin um, this wonderful Easter event. And then, obviously, on Sunday is Easter Sunday. So, again, what a great time for you to invite um, a family member who hasn't been here in a long time, a neighbor, a friend, a co-worker, as we as Christians celebrate the pinnacle of our, of our, our religion, our belief, uh, Jesus' resurrection from the dead and how great of an event and life-changing moment that is in our lives. And so we want to extend to that um, to others. So please invite um, someone to that. A couple of uh, save the date uh, type things coming up in May. May 7th, we have a worship night that would be here um, around 7 p.m., I would imagine. Yes, 7 p.m. There's going to be a worship night here. Um, another way for you to invite some friends and family to come to that. And then another in, uh, event in May is May 12th. We're going to have our Metronomes concert. Uh, and they put on a wonderful performance every time that they're here. Uh, no matter what style of music you enjoy, I can assure you, you will love um, to watch them and to listen to them uh, in concert here on May 12th. So with that said, again, thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time to worship with us this morning. And as we begin this service, let us remember Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. And then we know the end of the story. Uh, but what comes in this week um, is a somber yet exciting moment. So as we continue to worship this morning, Remember the Easter season. Remember Christ is the King. And Christ is risen from the dead.
with me, please. We're going to sing together these great hymns of the faith that proclaim the glory of Christ coming into, the, into Jerusalem that glorious and happy day.
it was a Hosanna kind of day. As we say in Kentucky, maybe a glory hallelujah kind of day. In fact, all four Gospels tell of Jesus' triumphal entry that day into Jerusalem. Along with his disciples and a crowd followed him, a crowd that had seen him perform many miracles and the raising of Lazarus. They followed him from Bethany down into Jerusalem. And as royalty or kings would do, he rode on a colt of a donkey. And also as military leaders, when they'd return home from war, victorious, often people would lay their cloaks before them on the ground, which would be a sacrifice on their own part. But the scriptures also say that they cut branches and they waved palm leaves in celebration. And thus we still celebrate the tradition of Palm Sunday. But the scriptures also say that they, the crowd, they shouted, Hosanna. Hosanna means adoration, praise, joy. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, as we just sang. But note, the scripture does not say that they calmly spoke or calmly sang those words. It said they shouted those words. In fact, Jerusalem took note of their worship. Now, I don't want you to miss this. Jesus welcomed that kind of worship. He didn't reject it. But just like every other place Jesus had been, there were some complainer Maynards there who didn't like it, particularly the Pharisees, the, up, the upstanding members of the church of the frozen chosen. They didn't like it. In fact, they boldly told Jesus, they said, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Tell them to simmer down. We, we don't do that here. But Jesus comes right back at them with a direct response. And he says, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the rocks will cry out. They can't keep it in. Today, as we gather to worship our Lord around the communion table, I think there's a question we ask ourselves based on what happened on that Palm Sunday. How would Jesus describe you and your worship for him? Would he describe it as a loud hosanna, adoration, and praise? Or would he describe it as a half-hearted mumble? Would he say, they, they can't keep it in. They just got to praise me with their whole being. Or would he say, they seem like they could take it or leave it. It seems like it's no big deal if they miss the worship of me. In the scriptures, in the Bible, there are over 100 verses that show that first of all, we're made to worship, and secondly, we are called to worship. Verses like Psalm 111.1, which says, praise the Lord. He says, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Congregation, let's not sin and cheat the Lord of giving him the full expression of worship that he deserves. Let's give, him, let's give him adoration, let's give him praise, not half-hearted, but with our whole being. Because after all, Jesus gave his whole being for us on the cross. Let's pray. Lord, we come today to worship you as the congregation. And may our worship be with our whole being. May you be pleased with the worship that we give you, because you deserve it all. For this we pray in your son's name. Amen. After a few moments of reflection and examination, I will come and we will partake of the Lord's Supper together.
In just five days after that Palm Sunday, Jesus was in the upper, upper room with his disciples, and he took bread, and he given thanks, and then he broke it and gave it to his disciples, and he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me, the body of Christ. Then in like manner, he took the cup, and he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And whenever you drink it, do it in remembrance of me, the blood of Christ. Can you hear me now? All right. But everybody just appreciated those updates and, and kind of letting us know where we're at. And I, and I just thought, you know, let's, let's do that just every quarter. Let's just kind of do a check-in on where we're at as a church and let people know. That's no reason to speculate. There's nothing to hide. This is the Lord's house and Lord gives. And so this year, um, that's what we're going to do. Kind of each quarter I'll come up and kind of share some of those things with you. And I have some really awesome stuff to share this as, as I went back and looked at some things, we're averaging 55 more people every week in our church services than we did this time last year. So our church is growing very well. <laughs> Refresh, uh, we just finished our first half of Refresh. It's off this week, uh, being spring break week, and then we'll continue the week following. But in our first part of Refresh this year, we're seeing 18 more people of our church engaged. In fact, there are people that come Wednesday night. That is how they started coming here Sunday morning. So Refresh has been a great outreach. It's been a great way to get engaged. And if you're not there, we encourage you to come uh, with pickleball, hands and feet, men and women's studies, children, youth. We have something for everybody to get engaged with. So we encourage you uh, to be part of that. But we're averaging 18 more people that are engaged on Wednesday nights. And that's wonderful. Uh, some of the best numbers we've definitely seen since COVID, and uh, things always seem to be continuing to get better. Every week we release the Herald. Everybody, if you don't get that, I encourage you to call the office and get on that list. It kind of gives you the updates of what's going on. And we've seen on the Herald uh, the, the giving each week. And some people are like, well, why is it up? Why is it down? There, there's concerns. Let me just tell you, uh, our leadership here is phenomenal. Our leadership here takes very very special concern and care to understand that they are stewards of God's house and of his money. And so I just wanted to assure you that uh, even though it may look like on the Herald that things aren't being met, I can tell you that we are still positive. We're not negative. Things are still operating. We've made some, had to make some cuts on things that we'd like to encourage and spawn off that growth that we've been seeing. And so we've had to pull back on some of those things. Uh, but we are able to continue to operate uh, through the faithful giving. So I encourage you to continue to give, give joyfully. And, and as those things continue to come in, know that the focus and the purpose of that is to spread the gospel, to spread the hope that we celebrate in this season. And so when you give there, it gives to missions, it gives to hands and feet, it gives to we care, it gives to our missionaries across the globe, it gives to Sarah Christian. It gives and gives and gives. And there's no greater way to do that. And so hopefully these type of updates encourage you and give you faith in the stewardship of the church so that you may be able to give joyfully and without reservation. So as we collect our offering today, let me pray. Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you. We thank you for all the gifts that we receive. We know as we studied a few weeks ago, it is your will, not ours. And God, when we really inspect and look at that, it's not the gifts and talents that we have amassed, but God, you have blessed us with. It's not the houses and the cars and the money that we've amassed, it's what you have blessed us with. 
God, Jesus told us that it is about the heart and about the joyful giver. It's not the amount. It's not the percentage. It's a heart thing. And so, God, I praise you and I pray for those that are giving. I pray for those that have the desire and are making adjustments. God, I pray for the offering that you set into this house. I pray for the leaders and their stewardship. But God, most of all, I praise you for the work that is going on here at Tate's Creek and the fact that you have entrusted us with more and more people. God, may we continue to be good stewards of discipleship and growth as we share the great word with all. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand one more time. We're going to be singing just a few verses of a great old hymn. You know it. Man of sorrow, what a name as we enter into this, the message of the morning. I got a phone call from my wife that said, hey, I just went to get Ava up, and there's throw up all over her bed. <laughs> and if you were a parent, you've certainly been there before, and you know what that moment feels like, and how it can kind of change your whole perspective of what the day before you is going to be like. And so uh, as I got up here today, I'm a little distracted, because I'm thinking about my wife, and I'm thinking about my daughter, and my thought was, you know, I wonder if there's something like that that happened to you this week or this morning that you go, like, I'm here, but I'm a little distracted. And so I thought, well, if it's true for me, it's probably true for somebody else. And so can we take just a moment to kind of try and remove that distraction before we get into God's Word? Would you pray with me? Lord, Lord, I, I want to pray for my little girl. I don't know what she's going through. I know she doesn't feel good. And I know there's some people in this room I've talked to this morning that they're not feeling great either. A little sore, a little tired, a little sad, a little lonely. Worried about other people, people that are important to us. And so, Lord, just to be honest, sometimes we approach your throne of grace with distraction. And we need your help. And so, Lord, one of the things I'm really grateful is that your word says that your Holy Spirit can intercede for us even when we don't have the words to speak. And so, Father, we're asking, would the Holy Spirit intercede for us in this morning? Lord, we pray, would you give us ears to hear and eyes to see, to focus in on your word this morning? That's what we need most, is we need you. So, Lord, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, in 2005, after the death of Pope John Paul II, a man named Rogers Caden had registered a variety of websites. He was a domain hoarder. And so he would get the names of all these websites, pay for them, and kind of reserve them just in case. And at the death of Pope John Paul II, he reserved www.benedictxvi.com, which turned out to become the name of the new pope. And so immediately, as soon as the Vatican announced the new pope, his website started getting flooded with traffic. Thousands of people started to visit his website. It blew up the servers. All this stuff was going on. And then a strange thing started to happen. He began to get offers to sell his website, which was his intent the whole time. Casinos came after him and said, we'll give you thousands of dollars for this website. And then thousands of good Catholics started messaging him too, saying, you need to give this to the church. Okay, you need to just turn this over. This is a big deal. And so Rogers, being raised Catholic, said, I'm going to try and avoid angering 1.1 billion Catholics and my grandmother. And instead of the money, he asked the Vatican for three things. He said, number one, I'll give you the website. First, give me one of those cool hats that the Pope wears. Number two, I want a free stay at the Vatican Hotel. And number three, complete absolution, no questions asked, for the third week of March 1987. It kind of makes you wonder about that third week in March in 1987. I said in my office, I thought, what did this guy do? I mean, something happened that week that when he thought, man, I need a get out of jail free card and this is it. This is my ticket. Is there a spring break? That's right. Yeah, that's, that sounds about, yeah, okay. We'll do the math there. He has a moment in his life that he wishes he could just erase. You have a week like that in your life? Spring break. Uh, you know, do you have a moment where you think back and go, I wish I could take that back. I wish I could have it expunged from the record. I, I wish that it could disappear or, or, or be gone and forgotten. Uh, just a straw poll. Be honest. Is there a moment in your, of, of your life, a week, a day, an hour, a second, where you go, I, I'm just, I'm ashamed of that moment. Anybody? That's, that's it? Some of you guys are like, no, I'm not ashamed of anything. I am. All right, now just do this. If you've got your hand up, raise your hand again if, if that's you. Okay, yeah, that's better that time. Okay, just tell the person next to you what that was. Okay, we're not going to do that. Okay, I'll tell you one of mine, okay? I can remember I was about 16 years old, and my dad bought one of those new copier scanners, and I love new technology. I love it. I'm fascinated by it, and so dad brings this home, and I was looking for an opportunity to learn this new piece of technology. I was looking for a project I could tackle. I didn't have anything, but two weeks later, the perfect opportunity came my way. It was report card day. Now, report card day for me was a great day. I was an honor roll student, so every time I got my report card, I was ready to come home. I was like, hey, mom, guess what today is? My brother was like, shut up, you know, quiet. He hated report card day. So that tells you a little bit about me and my brother. But there was a guy who liked it even less. It was his best friend, a guy named Adam. Adam had a really rough day. And so Adam and my brother Tony come to me and they say, hey, Justin, we got a real problem here. Uh, we need to change Adam's report card. And we want to know if you can use the new scanner, copier, to, to do that. I saw it as a personal challenge. I mean, how am I going to turn that down? And so I said, well, let's see what we can do. And so the first thing we had to do is figure out what font did the school use. And so we tried lots of things, and we kept printing things and going, that's not it, that's not it. And then finally I figured out what font it was. And then I had to white out his old grade and, and replace it with a new grade and get it lined up just right at all the right angles. And then we got that right. And then I said, well, their copier at school is really old, and so all their letters look a little faded. My dad's new copier looks nice and sharp, and so we had to make it age a little bit and make it look a little worn. And so we tried and tried and tried, and eventually we got it just perfect. I mean, it was indistinguishable except for his grade, you know. And so it looked awesome. And so he took this home and had his parents sign it. Nobody was the wiser. It, it worked flawlessly until about two weeks later, my family decides to take a trip, a family vacation to Niagara Falls. And so it's an eight-hour car drive, and about 30 minutes into the car drive, me and my brother are sitting there. My dad's in the front seat, and he just kind of calls back. He goes, hey, boys, guess what I found the other day? And we go, what? He goes, I found Adam's report card. Now, I don't know if you came to church to get a life lesson, but this one's for free, okay? Um, don't give the most important job of the mission to the dumbest guy in the room. Okay, my job was to work all the technology. Adam's job was throw away the copies that don't work. 
All you had to do is get rid of the evidence. And I probably tried about 30 different iterations of this before I got it right. I said, Adam, throw this away. Did he put it in the shredder? No. Did he put it in the trash can? No. You know where he took it? He threw it under my dad's desk, just on the floor. No big deal. And so dad comes home from work one day. He gets into his desk. He feels something on the floor. He goes, what's that? He picks up a piece of paper. He goes, oh, it's Adam's report card. I need to send this to his parents. He goes, oh, there's another piece of paper. He pulls it up. It's Adam's report card. After about 30 of those, he figured out what was going on. And he knew Adam was not smart enough to do this on his own. And so he looks at us and goes, all right, boys, come clean. My brother tried for another five minutes to lie his way out of it. But I knew right away, honor roll student, we were busted and it was over. And my dad said, we'll talk about this when we get home. And when we got home, we never talked about it. He, he never gave us a punishment. There was no consequences. He never brought it up again. And honestly, that was the worst punishment I ever could have had. I kept wondering, when is the hammer going to drop? When am I going to pay for what I did wrong? I, I knew I was guilty. I knew I deserved punishment. What I didn't expect was the shame. I, I'd broken this trust with my dad. On the one hand, I was an honor roll student, but I'd lost all my honor. I was a liar. I was a cheat. And my dad knew it. And so there was a part of me that said, I'm ashamed. Now, that wasn't the last time I was going to feel that emotion. In fact, I, I look back at my life, there's lots of moments where I feel a sense of shame. And I'm not going to tell you about any of those. There's, there's moments that are far more personal, far more full of regret, moments that I wish I could get back, moments that, that feel like a stain on my life that I just can't get rid of. And that's not anything new. I mean, this feeling of shame, this has existed since humanity began. It stems all the way back to the dawn of creation in the Garden of Eden. Remember Genesis 2.25, it says, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Can you imagine that? Not the naked part, the other part, okay? The, the not ashamed no shame, no regrets, no brokenness. That's God's original design for you. To be able to stand before your creator without any embarrassment, without any rejection, without any dishonor or feeling exposed, no disgrace, completely unashamed. And then right after that, Adam and Eve listen to the lies of a serpent. They eat from a forbidden tree. And guilt and shame enter into the world. Daniel DeWitt writes this. Though guilt and shame are twins born in the garden only moments apart, they aren't identical. Guilt's usually tied to an event. I did something bad. Shame is tied to a person. I am bad. Guilt is the wound. Shame is the scar. You ever notice that? That when we sin, two things are born. There's guilt and then there's shame. It's the difference between I told a lie and I'm a liar. Shame is what makes sin ever present with us. It, it labels us by our worst moments. I'm a loser. I'm, I'm an addict. I'm a failure. I'm a fraud. I'm a hypocrite. Sometimes our shame is public and everybody finds out. And then there's other times our shame is hidden and we'll do everything we can to make sure nobody finds out. But we look ourselves in the mirror. It's what some have called a soul-crushing, identity-warping emotion. That all we can see is this person we've become. And it's complicated because shame can sort of stem from different places. Uh, the, the first kind of shame stems from our sin. It, it, it's our sin. The reason we feel shame is because you should. You did something wrong. There's something to be ashamed of. That's what the Bible calls sin. You, know, you ever done something and you knew it was wrong in the moment? And then you tried to kind of put it out of your mind. And then you went home. And that night when you laid your head on a pillow, it's all you can think about. When you wake up in the morning and you look in the mirror, you just see yourself in a whole different light. You think about what you did and now it's become who you are. And so the scripture talks about this idea of shame. This scar that remains. Some people try and hide it. Some people try and bury it. Some people go, I'm not ashamed of anything. But if you... Dug a little deeper and a little deeper and a little deeper. Somewhere buried beneath all of that is this shame. And there's all these things that point to it, but it's buried deep beneath the surface. Shame has the ability to either crush us or open up our eyes. That's not the only kind of shame, though. There's a second kind of shame that stems from other people's sin against us. 
Now, some people are carrying a, a sense of shame because of what other people did. When I was a youth pastor, I, I saw this all the time. I, I had students in high school ministry and college ministry whose parents had abandoned their family. They had a family member who sexually abused them. There were people in their life that had sins of legalism and drug abuse and gambling and pornography. It wasn't the sins of my students. It was the sin of somebody else. But that didn't stop them from feeling the shame. There's not a lot of things harder than watching a 15-year-old girl be ashamed of who she is because of somebody else's sin. And there's people in this room that you carry it with you. You carry the shame, not because of what you did, but because of what somebody else did. That you are not someone else's sin. It's not your identity. Unfortunately, the enemy doesn't care about that. <laughs> he just wants you to feel shame. He, he just wants to manipulate you or, or cling to this identity that he keeps whispering in your ears. That's why scripture calls him an accuser and a liar. So it's whether it's true or not, he's going to accuse you and not just say, this is what you did. He's going to say, this is who you are. You're awful, you're weak, you're a failure. You're always going to mess up. You're never going to get it right. You're a waste, you're hopeless. June Hunt, who was an author and Christian counselor, began to see it in the lives of people who struggle with addiction. She noticed this pattern that was at work in them. She writes, with the heart of every addict is a sense of shame. Shame because of feeling unlovable, unworthy, and unwanted. Shame resulted from repeated failure. And this shame within an addict produces behavior and beliefs that are most predictable. And those aren't predictable behaviors that exist just in addicts. They exist in everybody who feels shame. They exist in all of us. Pastor Craig Grishel calls these predictable behaviors shame-based thinking. That when we feel shame, it begins to change and transform the way that we think about things. And so, for example, one predictable behavior of shame is to become a perfectionist. You, you feel a sense of shame and say, you know what, I don't want anybody to know that. I don't want anybody to feel or sense that off of me. And so I'll just do everything else right. And if I'm always perfect, then they'll never see this thing that I'm trying to hide. And so sometimes, especially in church, there's this desperate need to always present ourselves as, I've got it all together. I don't make mistakes. I always have the Christian answer. I always do the Christian thing. I'm perfect. And as long as people see me as a good Christian person here every Sunday, they'll never suspect the shame that I feel. And that is a horrible weight to carry. Because you can't be perfect. And so we spend all this energy trying to project an image of us that's not real. And we hide this shame instead of bringing it out in the open. It's a desperate attempt to silence the shame. And it's exhausting. And the shame always catches up. Another example of shame-based thinking is, is to be critical. We see things in ourselves that we don't like, things that we're ashamed of, which makes us really good at seeing it in other people. And so you take your own failures, your own flaws, and you can spot them in other people a mile away. They can try and hide it, but you go, no, 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 I, I know you because I know me. And so the consequence is, is sometimes we can become critical of other people because we're really critical of ourselves. In fact, some of the most critical people that exist are not people who have the gift of discernment. They're not people who are particularly wise. They're people who are full of shame sometimes. And so they take that shame and they put it on other people. You know, shame on you, shame on you, shame on you because they don't know how to deal with with the shame that they have. And so their defense me mechanism becomes a way of spreading the shame. If it's on you and it's on me, then it's not quite as bad. And so we don't like ourselves and we lash out at other people. It's sort of like trying to clean up oil with water. It just smears and makes a mess. But it never gets clean. I'll, I'll give you one more example of shame-based thinking. It's to be self-destructive. You know what? I'm going to fail anyway, so why even try? I never do the things that I want to do, so, so let's just give up. Why not just have a drink? Why not turn to another addiction? Why not eat? Why not just work all day and night? Why not take another pill? Why even get out of bed? It's our desperate attempt to preempt the shame. 
before the shame can sink in and I can feel the full effects of it, I'm going to beat it to the punch. I'm not going to get my hopes up. I'm not going to try harder. I'm not going to try again. I'm not going to be made new. I'm just going to resolve that I'll never be enough. I'll never be right. I'll never be whole. I'll beat it to the punch. And so I'll binge and I'll distract and I'll run and I'll self-sabotage. Now, some of you might be thinking, you know, I thought we were on a series on Mark. You know, this doesn't feel right. It's Palm Sunday. I thought we'd be talking about Jesus and the cross, but we're talking about Jesus and the cross. This is central to Mark's idea of Jesus' death and crucifixion. If you've got a Bible, and I hope you do, let me show you. It's in Mark chapter 15. Now, there's a lot of ways that people could talk about Jesus' death. If you've been going to church for a long time, and I know many of you have, you've heard tons of sermons about the crucifixion, about Jesus' death. You've learned all sorts of things about this moment in history. Maybe you've heard somebody say, you've heard that the Persians invented crucifixion, but the Romans perfected it. Maybe you've heard sermons about the pain and the suffering that Jesus endured and some of the horrors of a death on a cross. Things like the flogging alone can kill you. Or the blood loss from having your back shredded apart. And the blood from the scars and of of the nails being driven into your wrist and your feet. But if that doesn't kill you, the awkward hanging position of the cross, you can still inhale, but it's difficult to exhale. And so in order to do it, you have to pull yourself up with your muscles being strained against those open wounds just to release a breath. And so eventually the body gets exhausted and tired and slowly suffocates. But Mark doesn't focus on that. He doesn't give us a forensic detailed description of the crucifixion. He doesn't focus on the pain of the cross. He draws our attention to the shame of the cross. Mark chapter 15, look at verse 16. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace. That's the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him, hail, king of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him, and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to be crucified. They dressed him like Caesar. Instead of a laurel wreath, they they, they put on a crown of thorns. Instead of a robe, they took one of their military cloaks and they draped it over him. Instead of a royal scepter in his hand, the Gospel of Matthew tells him that they give him a reed or a staff. But Mark says that they take that same reed and they beat him with it. Instead of shouting, Hail Caesar, Emperor, that was their custom. They shouted, Hail King of the Jews. And they kneeled and they spat on his face over and over and over again. This was more than the soldiers handing out a sentence. This was soldiers handing out shame. They didn't mock what Jesus did. They mocked who he claimed to be. That's what you would expect from the Romans. Look at verse 22. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. Crucifixions were performed just outside of major cities. They would do it right on the major road, so everybody who was coming in the city and leaving the city would see this poor soul hanging there, right along the road. They weren't done in dungeons, they weren't done in prisons, behind closed walls, they were done in public They were spectacles. Prisoners were forced to carry this giant wooden beam to the place of their crucifixion. The same beam that they were about to be nailed to. But Jesus' body gives out and he stumbles. And so they, they pull a man out of the crowd to carry the cross for Christ. Verse 23. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he didn't take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. Now Romans, typically they would crucify people naked. It was just a way to add to the humiliation, to add to the shame. But when you look at artwork of any crucifixion, rarely are you ever going to see Jesus depicted naked. 
And so that's led some scholars to believe that maybe the Romans made a concession to the Jews. That out of the Jewish sensibility, they wouldn't strip a person completely naked. Maybe they would leave like a loincloth on him. And that might be the case. Or maybe over the years when we thought about our Savior being crucified, it was just too much to bear. And so out of tradition, artists have clothed him. But he was present before all, exposed and publicly shamed. Verse 25. It was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The king of the Jews, even his sentence nailed above his head was intended to mock him. Verse 27, and when they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left, and those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, ah, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross. See, it wasn't just the Romans. It was the people passing by. His fellow Jews taunting him. Jesus, save yourself. You said you'd destroy the temple. Who's getting destroyed now? You said you would rebuild it in three days. You can't even get yourself off the cross. Verse 31, so also the chief priests and the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, he saved others. He can't save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. The religious leaders begin to join him with the crowd. Mark says that even the two men crucified on his side, they made their own comments as well. Literally all of humanity was mocking the Son of God. From the Roman soldiers to the religious leaders to the common man walking by to the common criminal hanging beside him. The cross of Christ was filled with shame. No palm branches, no hosannas, no angelic choir filling the heavens, shouting out his praises as the heavens parted and the sun shone down on him. No, none of that was present, just shame. Mark makes it clear, he brings it front and center. He doesn't focus on the pain, he focuses on the humiliation. The entire process is an act of ridicule and contempt. Why? I mean, why would Jesus endure all of this? Now, you've been in church a long time, and most of you have. You go, well, he had to die for our sins. I get that. Why this way? Why? Why couldn't he just go into the temple and say, Father, unto you I, I, I give my spirit and just pass out? Right at the, at the, the throne, of the, the, the seat of the temple. Why didn't he lay himself down on the Ark of the Covenant or at the altar? He doesn't do any of those things. Why the cross? Why the humiliation? Why the shame? The answer comes in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. It says, therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And here we go. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And he's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Despising the shame. He hated it. He detested it. He, he loathed the scars that had been left behind. Our sin may have nailed Jesus to the cross, but Jesus drove a nail through your shame. Not only did Jesus deal with what you did, he transformed who you are. You are no longer defined by your sin. The very thing that you want to keep most secret and most hidden, he wants to pull out into the open and remove as far as the east is from the west. You are a new creation. You are a son or daughter of the Most High, a co-heir with Christ. You are holy and blameless, adopted, redeemed, forgiven. You're free. 
Jesus did not die on Calvary for the joy of soldiers mocking him. It wasn't for the joy of people jeering him. It wasn't the joy of the nails being driven through his hands and feet. It was the joy of knowing that sin and shame were being crucified so that you could stand in his presence fully exposed and unashamed. A new identity. That when God sees you, he doesn't see your sin. He sees a savior. If shame is the scar, then it's no mistake that when Jesus returned in his resurrected body and he asked Thomas to touch the scars, it wasn't just proof that Jesus had died for his sins. It was a reminder that he also took our shame. I have no idea how you see yourself when you look in the mirror, but I can promise you how God sees you. That if you claim Jesus as as your Lord and Savior, he sees Jesus. That's what he sees when he looks at you. And some of you know your sins are forgiven, but you're still carrying around your scars. And you don't have to. That's the reason he has them. And so in just a moment, we're going to sing one more song, and then we're going to end our service a little bit differently today. And so don't sneak out. I want to do something special as we prepare our hearts for Easter. But if you've never made that decision, if you've been walking around with your own scars, your own shame, and today is the day where you go, I I don't want any more of that. I want to be rid of that. I want to be free. I, I, I don't want any more scars. That can be true of you today. If you'd like to talk about what it means to follow Jesus, to be unashamed, I'll be right down front. As we stand and sing together, would you stand together? final verses of Mark 15. And we want you to slow down and meditate on these words from Mark's gospel. The final moments of Jesus' life. And as we move through this week, from Palm Sunday to Monday, Thursday to Good Friday, we want to prepare our hearts so that when we return together on Sunday morning, We are ready for the stone to be rolled away and the Easter story. So I invite you to sit quietly and listen to these words. We invite you to take a moment when those words are finished to quietly pray. And we'd ask that you would leave quietly this morning when you're ready. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he's calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, 
put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let's see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the temple of the curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he had breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James the younger, and Joseph and Salome. And when he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him, and there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. And when an evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. Joseph brought a linen shroud, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and the mother of Joseph was where he was laid. <clears throat> 